编制的一个二零一八年前十大技术趋势，其中一个呢就是生物标记，呃，是跻身了前十大科技。呃，关于这些技术呢，大家明天早上的发布会也可以在媒体中心，呃，进行更多的了解。那么我们知道有一些医疗呢，现在已经开始个性化了，比如说像乳腺癌，现在就可以按照不同的类型来去做定制化的治疗方案。但是我们都知道，呃，精准医疗还有很长的路要走，未来才能够实现每个人精准化的医疗。所以今天的讨论呢，我们就来具体探讨一下。精准医疗目前取得的发展，我们未来又有哪些展望的前景？今天和我一道讨论这一话题的，首先介绍一下，坐在我左边的是汪健先生，他是华大基因的董事长和联合创始人。在汪先生旁边的是 Elizabeth D. Los Pinos Pont， 他是美国的初创生物技术公司 Aura 的创始人兼 CEO。在 Elizabeth 旁边的是 J. a y Flatley， 也是美国的一家生物科技公司 Illumina 的执行主席。About precision medicine and and how it started, and、uh, I'd like to start with you, John, if I may.、Um, you you were、uh, you know at BGI working starting around the time of the Human Genome Project. Can you tell us how that kicked things off and where your company is today? It was a long time ago when we were the, when we was a postdoc at the University of Washington. That time we were in Seattle when President、uh, George Washington,、uh, George Bush, started the Human Genome Project. That was 1998 years ago. We were talking about the, bring the Genome Project back to China. So since then. And we are part of the Human Genome Project, but we had some problem in China to get、uh, people realize how important for that. So it's a little bit difficult to convince people, the mainstream、uh, research people in China, to support the Genome Project. So we, in the 1990s. 1999, we started BGI because we want to join the, the Human Genome Project. We cannot get approved, so we started our own. So the BGI is a very funny name. They call the Beijing Genomics Institute, but we are not in Beijing anymore. We are in in Shenzhen. We are the first one, still only one private research institute and companies. So we have double face. <laughs> Doing the basic research for the public interest, and also the private company to make money to survive, <laughs> to feed ourselves. So it's a, it's a little bit different with uh, uh, Jay and the people. So we are the still we are the only one, the private institute work on the basic research in China. Yeah,、uh, in China. And、um, it, it's genomics work. I mean, in genetics research, can you tell anything、uh, to people about、uh, your processes in particular? Well, the, the very beginning, the early nineties, we are used the single sequencer.、Uh, and, uh, I think we bought lots of uh, uh, Promega. Oh, the, 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 not Promega. The, the,、uh, The megabase and the FBI is a, a sequencers and from the nineties, and then 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 the、uh, the synthetic sequencer come over uh, uh, to the market. The first contact us was、uh, that time they called the、uh, Solexa, the early days. And then the、uh, Inumina take over the, the Solexa. We work closely with Jay. We had a very good time at the beginning. <laughs> They support us. We also support Inumina. We were the biggest customer for the Inumina at the, the, the early days. So both of us push the, the genome project quickly, spread the whole work. 
So we still memorize the good days. <laughs> and then like, uh, when the channel realized the sequence is so important for the people, but the cost is, was the biggest issue. So we try to, to, to lower the cost to cover more, more people. So that why, it, and then I ask uh, Jay, so we, we should work more closely to set up a joint venture or something. And they said, well, we have, I'm very happy to do that, but it, we have to get approval from the Wall Street people. That time I didn't understand what that means. <laughs> now we are also, BJ, we are a subsidiary, also it's a public company. We also have the pressure from the Chinese stock market. <laughs> now I realize how difficult it is to deal with the investors. <laughs> they want to make money from, <laughs> from this uh, business. We also need money to survive. But uh, the real goal is to bring the, the genome research to the application, to the China to the whole world to really benefit the people to push the precision medicine quickly to cover the whole medical society. Now the biggest challenge is for us, Illumina and BGI, how to bring the cutting edge technology to the ordinary people to lower the cost to cover the whole big population. So as I told that this public is so many times. How to make everybody really available, affordable, also for for the uh, physicians, for the patients, it's valuable for the RMBs, for the for the dollars they paid. So this is a big challenge. So again, I like to uh, Shake hands. We already shake hands with, with Jay. Say, we are the partners, good friends, and then we are sort of competitors. Now we're still good friends. Now we, we can work together, become a, what's called a, a co, co, what's a, collaborator. Collaborator and the competitors. <laughs> sort of like a. Uh, <laughs> Uh, now that we we already know that China and the, and the U.S. has some kind of uh, uh, competitors stuff going on. <laughs> Even for me, I had a very difficulty to get a U.S. visa every year. <laughs> they check me again and again. They give me difficult time. <laughs> Well, you raised some important points. So you raised the point of first convincing people that precision medicine would be valuable for them, yeah, would yeah. be useful. You raised the point of cost being an issue and of finding technology solutions. And this seems like a good place to come to you, Jay, to talk about the work Illumina has done, the, driving, the technologies that are driving precision medicine and the way you have worked to bring costs down. Sure. Well, let me... Uh maybe start, if I could, by slightly enlarging the definition of precision medicine, Good. because um, the original definition, which we all love, that, that I think you gave us, is very focused from the therapeutic angle on how you use genomics and, and drugs together. Um, but there's, there's an enormous emerging segment in diagnostics that sometimes involves a drug and sometimes doesn't, whether that's you know, scanning the HLA region of the genome to determine or look at rejection potential for a transplant, or um, you know, whether it's diagnosing rare diseases in children where there's often not a drug to treat the disease. Uh, those, to us, are great examples of genomic medicine, uh, not just you know, the traditional definition of precision medicine. But if you look back um, about the time the first human genome was sequenced in 2001, it cost about $100 million to do a genome, and it took all the machines in the world a year to do that. Um, by about 2007, the cost was a million dollars, plus or minus. Um, took one machine about three years to sequence one human genome, and now uh, the latest generation technology sequences a human genome in about an hour. 
and uh, the cost has dropped significantly under $1,000. And uh, we've indicated to the market that we expect the architecture that we have in the marketplace today to get us to about the $100 genome. So we continue to see these order, orders of magnitude uh, change, and that's what's enabled the explosion of genomics and the ability to now think about and contemplate sequencing millions of people rather than tens or hundreds of people. So I, uh, I took your point about the value of uh, diagnosis as well as therapeutics, but, but coming to Ellie, I'd love to talk to you about bringing precision treatments into the clinical setting. Can you talk about what Aura is doing? Yeah, so Aura was a tech pioneer by the World Economic Forum eight years ago. We came with the idea that we could use viruses to deliver drugs to tumors. And uh, what we do is uh, create artificial viruses synthetically uh, that are targeted to tumors as a way of precision medicine because what we want in oncology is to deliver very potent cytotoxics um, directly where they are needed without the side effects of cur current therapies. So that idea of bringing a drug into the clinic um, is uh, something that has evolved and uh, that we're trying to make more efficient. Um, there is a lot of innovation, and the problem is that clinical trials are extremely expensive. So there's a way where regulators and innovators are working together to make sure that these innovations come, arrive to patients faster. For example, in my company, one of the things that uh, uh, happened very early was what we call the fast track designation by the FDA. That means that when you develop something that it's extremely an unmet medical need and you have a therapy that can potentially save uh, lives of patients, the FDA works very closely with the developers to make sure that that clinical trial is well designed, is uh, ad an adaptive clinical trial. So we learn that when we're innovating, we're innovating both in terms of the drug, but as, as much as we innovate on the drug, we innovate on how we develop that drug. And cl adaptive clinical trials are critical to make sure that we develop them faster. So those are kind of examples of why I'm optimistic. I think that uh, innovation, especially in oncology, is making huge um, improvements, and uh, hopefully that will translate into better therapies for patients very soon. Can you tell us just a little bit more about the adaptive clinical trials and how do you manage the, the data and the changes that are, that are being um, tracked through them? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a, a huge improvement and something that uh, uh, it's changing the way we develop drugs. So an adaptive clinical trial, usually you compare a drug versus another drug or a drug versus placebo. And it has to be what we call a masked randomized trial. So everything is blinded so that no one knows if the patient receives one drug or a placebo or another drug to make sure that the data is reliable. Um, and that it's locked, the statistics are locked from the beginning. That's a traditional way. But in an adaptive clinical trial, what happens is that you usually power your statistics for interim looks at the trial. And for example, if a particular patient population is benefiting very much better, um, you can detect that early. If the drug is not working, you can stop the trial early. And if the drug is working really well for ethical matters, you can also approve the drug faster. So those are ways where you know, adaptive trials are so useful. Um, and also it reduces the cost of developing a therapy. Um, so that's an example of, of how we're um, um, doing it in oncology especially, but it's applied to all, all other therapeutic areas as well. So I think we've gotten an overview of at least how, uh, how these therapies started, how we started to address um, costs, that precision me medicine is, is certainly about therapeutics, but not just about that. It's also got an important role in diagnostics, and that through working with, with regulators, we're just starting to be able to uh, create these adaptive clinical trials and um, bring the medicine uh, to, or medicine or treatments, to people a bit faster and perhaps more cost effectively. But one thing that's hanging over all of this uh, for me is data. Um, you, you mentioned already, Jay, how, how long it used to take to, uh, to sequence a whole genome and how much, um, how much data that is to store and to use and to manipulate. You know, how, how do we handle that data? What are some of the latest ways we're, we're using that today? 
Well, it's interesting early on in, in the history of next generation sequencing, uh, customers wanted to actually take raw images off the sequencer because they weren't confident in the algorithms that we and others provided to analyze the raw images. And then those data sets became too large, so then they they wanted to just take off the uh, the uh, variant calls ultimately from the sequencer. And so as, as we've increased the output, the necessity to do more on board the sequencer has continued to go up. Um, we've worried about the data generation problem for a long time, and I think um, the, the, uh, the, the great breakthrough that came about really five years ago was the advent of the cloud. And now the ability to put data in the cloud uh, gives our customers elastic computing capability as, as well as near infinite storage capability. Um, so that's been uh, incredibly important to the development of this field. Um, and while that's going on, we continue to do more and more on board the sequencer, and we'll ultimately get to the point where we're just sending out of the sequencer differences from the reference genome. So those data sets will ultimately become smaller and smaller. But we have to get uh, more agreement on what the reference really is and more standardization before that can be possible. But the, but the cloud has been a significant uh, advance here. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> how about data sharing? Uh, making that data available to others. How, how are researchers at, at doing that now? I know that we work with uh, closely with the hospital doctors and they, the patients and the, the hospital owns the data. We just do the service. But now we work closely with the government. Let's say we work from city to city. As for example, we are doing the, the uh, uh, the, the prenatal uh, testing, we set up a blockchain uh, technology there, and the, the patient, the, the, uh, the, pre the pregnant women, and the, the hospital doctors, and the government, and, and us, share the database. So also, the already published the paper, we shared the, the whole database for the open for everybody. Uh, we are going to have uh, uh, three million sequence data uh, published in the sale uh, next couple of weeks. And the data will be made available for the whole world. We have actually have uh, 14, uh, 1,400 thousand data. And, uh, have the, all this uh, clinic information and the sequence information put in the public database to share with the people. So, so right now we still need a really big database for the, the real world. So now the, the, for the legal challenge right now is uh, the FDA, the, uh, not only the Chinese FDA, also the U.S. FDA, the traditional uh, approved the license is for the limited uh, gene fragment and uh, uh, mutations. But the real world is there's lots of unknown uh, uh, mutations changes. So what the real challenge is, is how to build the big database for every patient, for every disease not only for the treatment, also for the preventions, for the precautions. So there will be the big, big uh, uh, challenge. So how to really lower the cost, as uh, Jay said, we, we have to lower to, to the $100, even lower than that. So make it really make everybody available, make a really database for the whole world, and everybody should really to figure out what's really going on. Data sharing has been a, a classical problem in this industry because, uh, as you might imagine, those who want to share the data are the ones who don't have it, and the ones who have it are the ones that don't want to share it. Uh, and uh, you know, particularly because there's commercial interests involved as well, and there's many commercial companies that have been set up to, to do large-scale sequencing and derive economic value from, from these data, um, there, there's less of an incentive to share. But uh, I think we're all aware that the value of the genomic data goes up exponentially as you can combine databases. Um, there's also been uh, increasingly concerns about moving data outside of the country in which it was generated. These rules vary country to country around the world. Um, so the way we're uh, beginning to approach this 
is with what we call a data federation model, so that you can have data residing on a local cloud in any given country, and you can federate a query uh, into that database, do the compute locally in that cloud, uh, do it in a de-identified way, and return the results to, this, to wherever the query originated. And, and if we can make this data federation model work, I think many more people will begin to be willing to share their data sets. I think there's something maybe we haven't made clear for the audience, um, and it's certainly something that you and I talked about, Ellie, which is as we gather all this data, we, uh, we also need to protect patient privacy while we're doing that. Is there, is there anything we can say about how we are you know, able to look at mass population data, but, but also make sure that an individual's privacy is protected? Well, it's a challenging problem because it was shown maybe five or eight years ago that simply from a genotype you can identify who the person is. And so, you know, it is very hard to anonymize DNA truly at, at the core technology level. Um, blockchain offers some opportunities for this, and there's been some great work done at Stanford and other places that have shown ways that you can query pieces of genomes and keep them totally de-identified. Um, but um, as we all know, we, you know, we leave our DNA around behind us, and you could sample this room after everybody leaves, sequence that DNA, and we could identify everybody here. So, you know, privacy is is a real challenge, particularly as it relates to uh, discrimination based on the genome, and that's really where the, the biggest question arises. Um, that I, that's actually a really excellent, um, uh, excellent point about discrimination, and that also leads me to insurance models and whether they are, you know, helping the progress of uh, precision medicine or hindering. I'm afraid that anything that is a framework like that has maybe has trouble keeping up with the technology. What what are we seeing there? What are we seeing, Ellie? I think. It is a challenging issue. Um, however, I always think that knowing more, understanding more is always for the better. Um, I see uh, as we create cost-effectiveness models that uh, if we, do, for example, develop drugs for a particular type of patient population and we really deliver value to those patients, then there is no so much pushback on the pricing. Um, so understanding the differences between us and uh, maybe allowing that for insurers, at the end of the day, benefits all. Um, it's, uh, it, of course, it has to be avoided from a discrimination point of view, but there is so much value to be gained um, from it. So I'm, I'm also thinking about, uh, so we, we talked a bit about <clears throat> data sharing and making that available, the idea of the data federation model, which is really intriguing. And uh, privacy is a real challenge, which, which it is. I'm, I'm kind of intrigued with the idea that somebody could take data samples of, of, of this room and identify us. But of course, the little cards on our tags also <laughs> do that too. Um, so thinking about how, how do you manage and deal with data makes me think about the effects of AI on the field and machine learning. Um, how is that changing how the, um, you know, how the data are processed these days? I think we still need to build a the bigger uh, database, and then there will be uh, artificial intelligence. Right now, there are so many things unknown. So I think it's, we're still at the early beginnings. Right now, the I only can do is for the past technology and the data and all this phenotypes. Right now, we are in BGI. What we are doing is so we're doing the, this uh, uh, build the data database from our employees, the employees' families. We have uh, 20 or 30,000 family members together, put all the data together, see how good is our database and what kind of uh, artificial intelligence we can use for that. It's the, the, the really answer, we realize that we still need the real data. A much, much bigger database, it will be much easier to, to bring the AI to come to the real, we call it bio-intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's not only the artificial intelligence, real bio-intelligence and, uh, and real intelligence. It's because everybody is different. We have three billions base pairs in 
single cell. So the artificial intelligence has some way, some way to go. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we have a growing deep learning team uh, inside the company, and we're already beginning to apply that commercially. Um, it's, it's even with, Jean's right, that we need much bigger data sets to make it better, but we've already dramatically improved some of our uh, fundamental calling algorithms for variants and things like that, uh, algorithms for identifying unusual places in the genome or unusual constructs in the genome that are difficult to call accurately. Um, and in, in the future, this is going to play an absolutely enormous role uh, in, in kind of changing the role of a physician because as we get to millions of people in these databases, the ability to even understand what the right questions are to ask is going to go away. And so deep learning technology is going to be necessary um, for us to have any chance of extracting the real underlying value that's going to exist in these data sets. So I'm, I'm going to give the audience a chance in a couple of minutes to start asking questions, and I just want to warn you of that. And when you do, I'd love you to identify yourself, please. But, but before I do that, I'd like to uh, pull on that thread about the physicians as well. I mean, uh, there's so many things for physicians to keep up with. You know, uh, assuming that you can even get the genetic profile, how, did, how are we supporting physicians in clinical areas so they know how to use this information? to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think that there is a, as drug developers, um, we do um, a great partnership with physicians. Our investigators are part of the development of each and every drug. And so there is a, a, a learning process there as we develop better and more targeted therapies that the physicians that will deliver them will be able to translate that information into the patients. I think that it's not so much the problem of the physicians, but the fact that patients now have so much awareness of what's being developed and uh, that they request that from the physician. So it's an obligation. It's no longer you know, uh, something that you can choose to, to do. Is there anybody who's um, got a particularly good model for supporting the physicians? Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, there, there are many ways that, uh, you know, there are many educational uh, companies that I think are medical relations and education that are doing an incredible job um, for physicians to keep up to speed. Um, but it's, uh, yes, I think it's a, it's a challenging one for physicians because medicine is evolving at an exponential way. And so, um, um, yes, I guess that the more specialization, it's going to be requested, yeah. I get asked often uh, how we're going to train all the physicians in genomic medicine, and um, that's a daunting problem. Uh, and and uh, you know, clearly, as they age out and there's more genomic education at the college level, it will be helpful. But I think part of the responsibility of technology companies is to figure out how to abstract the complexity uh, of sequencing and genomics away, so that the physician can ask the. The, the, the question that's relevant to the patient and not have to worry about how the data uh, are generated. And so we envision the day in the not very distant future where, uh, you know, instead of making a diagnosis based on the last 10 patients they saw, the physician says, you know, here's the uh, genotype of the patient in front of me, here's what I know about the presentation of the disease, what are the 50 uh, most recent cases that have that genotype, how were they treated, and what were the outcomes? And, and that's really where this is all going. And I think that has a relate, uh, the, um, correlation with drug development because most of the failures are because of the difference between animal models and the heterogeneity of humans. And so the more we genotype and understand humans, the more that we can translate that into better animal models that can predict the efficacy of the drugs. So it's a, it's a direct loop that uh, will make it, uh, I think, a more efficient process. So in China, there's different problems. Uh, we are still the developing countries. That the whole uh, genome science education system is far behind the U.S. So the, the clinicians and uh, the students, it's a brand new things for them. So we have more difficulty to apply this to the uh, uh, clinical applications. So the education. Uh, the, the training still the biggest challenge ahead of the China and Africa. All of this, 
uh, uh, developing countries. Now that our government proposed the, the, the Belt and the Road Initiative, that was the biggest challenge for us. So how to teach people, how to make people understand that what's the, the big data means, so many genome data, what's the really uh, uh, the, uh, relation between the data and the, the, the uh, clinical uh, meanings. So this is a big challenge for mm. us. So we, and the, the privacy is a little bit behind those. We have to make sure people understand that, and then privacy things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we have more uh, difficulty and more challenge ahead in China. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I'd like to give the audience an opportunity to ask a question or two. If not, I have plenty more. I see one in the back of the room there. Could you please wait for the mic? And please identify yourself. Uh, hi, my name is Angela Wu from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, I've been following with great interest uh, models such as nebula genomics that attempt to deal with both privacy issues and also um, patient, patient ethics, you know, their choice uh, to be involved in certain studies and so on by using the blockchain and cryptocurrency type of model. I'm just interested in what you guys think about that and how it might apply to other forms of data um, outside of genomics, specifically for Ellie, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, it's an area that we've been looking at very closely, and I think um, you know the blockchain technology is is quite promising, as I mentioned earlier, for um, securing patient privacy and encoding the genome in a way that allows it to not be un, un uh, or to, to be decoded, if you will. Um, I think it's also got potential in trying to track value for discoveries, because one of the reasons, back to the data sharing question, people don't want to share data is because they don't get the economic value if they do. Blockchain has the ability in some ways to tag information that people discover and, and to uh, allow some sort of crypto return, if you will, uh, if somebody used that data in a particular way. So it's, it's an area of great fascination and one we're looking at and tracking very closely. Any others? One in the front here. You know, it's, uh, the anti-biotics um, use is very important. But I know, as far as I know, the, uh, in China, I have been in China for, for 10 years. I noticed the, the, the fact that no matter what's the infection from bacteria, virus, and the fungi infections, they treat it as the same, use the, use the antibiotics. But based on my understanding, you know, a lot of cases the misdiagnosed or mistreated as well. So the, the, the precision medicine, that's the question for gene, okay? It is not only for the gene sequencing or some, you know, but also it's the precision diagnosis is most important for the diagnosis treatment. Would you please, you know, have your comments you are the answers, uh, Jane, that's a question for you. Okay. So I know that, that infection disease is most important right now in China. And how to use the uh, sequence technology for that. We did that uh, uh, 15 years ago. We did that, the SARS sequence quickly. And uh, for all this unknown uh, disease, if we do the meta, Shotgun sequence, large scale, say, let's say the uh, uh, million coverage, billion coverage, we get it. one of the million chance to gather the, 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 the unknown uh, uh, sequence fragment. We can identify that. Now the real question is how much are you willing to pay? If we do the millions, Okay, we get one of the millions. Uh, that means very high concentration you can easily identify. If you do the billion fragment sequence, you still cannot find that. You do tariff basis. That means you need a huge data to find the one of billions, one of the uh, tariffs to find the one uh, sequence. That before we use the target method, okay, we we can get some little bit higher uh, 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 sensitivity to get the target 
If it's an unknown disease, it's an easy way. Just do the billing sequence and the thyroid sequence. You can find that. It's the uh, statistical issues. Depending on how cheap sequence can go, how big data you want to produce, and then you get the, the chance easily to calculate. Now we are working with the people. Say if you do the one of millions, we get the 20, 30 of the uh, unknown uh, fever and uh, some kind of infection. We can identify the virus and the bacteria, the fungi, this kind of things. If you do billions, who's going to pay? There's really two separate pieces to this question in my mind. One is um, outbreak monitoring or uh, you know, prevention of, of the spread of outbreaks. And the technology now is advanced enough and is economical enough that the world should just embrace this and put this in all the hospitals of the world because you can, you know, once you, you have somebody who's sick, it's very easy to sequence that virus or bacteria and identify what it is in, in uh, trace it back to its origin and stop the outbreak quite quickly. And so that's something that, that I think we, you know, the infrastructure around the world just doesn't support yet, but, but the technology is at the point and the databases are at the point where that could be done. Um, the second question I think that Jim was getting to is diagnosing an individual patient. So if you take a blood sample or uh, you know, CSF fluid and you sequence that deeply enough, you can find all kinds of things in the bloodstream, not only uh, virus and bacteria, but you can find cancer uh, DNA and things like that. And so that's where you need deep sequencing is if you're trying to find rare occurrences in the blood or, or CSF. So a question over here. So Raj Lehel from Celestia Biotech, Basel. A question for you, Elizabeth. Uh, with all this NGS sequencing we're doing, so we are generating a huge amount of data, but the problem, you don't you think we're really lagging behind is on drug development side? You have all these mutations sitting in front of you, but we have only a handful of drugs to, corresponding drugs to treat those uh, mutations? Yeah, so the, uh, the understanding of the differences in oncology on all of the uh, heterogeneity of each patient is a huge challenge. Um, the reality is that we have phenomenal drugs for a few uh, characterized cancer patients, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the, uh, I think there's a, a, a big promise in, into what I was calling adaptive clinical trials because it is not only developing a drug for, or a targeted drug for a cancer, but when you are developing a drug and you see a particular patient population that it's benefiting more, it's sequencing that, understanding that really well to then see why are, is that patient population responding differently that you had anticipated and learning from it. Um, but the reality is that we know very little still on, uh, on cancer, and, and cancers are not defined from the beginning. Sometimes they evolve. Um, in melanoma, for example, we know that you take a biopsy at the beginning or different places in the cancer will give you a different genetic profile. And so within the same patient, there are differences that are not the same drug may target. So while I, I'm always optimistic, and I think that we've done amazing improvements, there's still a lot to learn. Um, and hopefully, you know, technologies like uh, uh, faster sequencing and cheaper sequencing will allow these to, uh, um, to speed up developing in a better way. And one of the hopes is that we'll be able to detect cancer earlier. Uh, we spun off a company called Grail uh, a couple years ago, and we've now raised $1.2 billion for this company. And the idea here is to simply sequence the blood of people who are asymptomatic, and this would be done at a routine physical, um, and be able to detect cancer at stage zero or stage one because the DNA from the cancer cells shed into the blood. Um, if this becomes reality, which we're confident it will, um, then we can detect cancers much, much earlier, and the vast majority of them will be curable through surgery. So, so that's kind of the pipe dream here, and uh, we'll Sounds see cool. uh, how this develops through the large clinical trials that Grail's and doing over the next few years. We were discussing that if we look in 50 years, we look back, this is probably one of the things that say, and they still look organ by organ. And right now we look organ by organ. Um, we look at the colon, we look at the uh, breast, um, but we have the blood, and that's where, you know, early diagnosis is going to really impact um, health care. Mm -hmm. 
coming to the middle here. Thank you. Martin Murphy of the CEO Roundtable on Cancer. Uh, first of all, a salute to the WEF for holding this session. I think it's visionary and I hope that it continues. In fact, I might make a suggestion that at some point we also include some lawyers, or at least a jurist, because really this, this whole area of privacy and confidentiality and so forth is in an area where all of us are touching it, but we're not really expert in it. Conversely, they, they need to help understand, we need to have them help understand it as well. On that, just a, a query that we, you may wish to touch, and that is in the realm of, in which I work, cancer clinical trials. Were you to ask patients, were they, would they want their material identified and available? The vast majority of patients are saying, yeah, absolutely, even if it doesn't help me, it may help somebody. We're not really giving patients the option to do really fully informed consents. And that may be an area, I know Jay, that you're, you're deeply involved in this as, as we are, is really to actually involve patients. Where are they here, the advocates that really want their genome available in all of its complexity? We need in our clinical trials for sure to begin providing them that option. And then maybe one last comment, and that was uh, the economic part of World Economic Forum and being able to, uh, to afford it, Professor Wang. Well, uh, in a way, there is an oncology belt and road, isn't there? It's called Roche Pharmaceuticals, with their acquisition of Flatiron, as well as with Foundation Medicine. You're looking at really economically providing to the individual physician, treating physician, information that is genomically based and that may, in fact, in a big data fashion, be relevant as well. Thanks. Thank you. So unfortunately, we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, I know that would go quickly. Maybe the speakers will be available for a couple of minutes afterward. But I, I thought it might be, so we've, we've covered quite a range on the progress and the promise of precision medicine. And um, I wondered if uh, each of the uh, panelists here would share with us uh, a thing that they are uh, worried about as they consider the future and a thing that they are very excited about to maybe take the room, uh, you know, have a summary to take, so for the room to take forward. I can start. Go ahead, please. Um, I'm worried about um, patients owning their data. I think that this is something that we really have to work on. It cannot be a data owned by the hospitals or the companies that sequence their genome. There has to be a way for patients to uh, own and share their data, but especially own it. That's my worry. Um, my excitement is about the exponential development in oncology. Um, I think that as I look 50 years into the future, I, we, my dream is that oncology will be a chronic disease. It will not longer be a life-threatening disease. And I think we're making such incredible advances that it is to be a, a time for optimism and uh, really exciting. Thank you. Let me just... Yeah. I, um... I gave a speech at uh, Harvard Precision Medicine Conference about nine months ago that I titled Shock and Awe of Precision Medicine, and I think that kind of encapsulates my view, the awe part being that um, the technology, the application of the te technology, the fundamental research is moving at such a breathtaking pace that um, the, the power that's going to be in our hands a decade from now is going to be absolutely astounding, and so that's what we work on every day and, and continue, continues to get me excited. Uh, the shock part is that the, we can't make the infrastructure go fast enough to keep up. And, you know, as fast as technology moves, um, you know, particularly in kind of the Silicon Valley world, uh, we all think we should be able to move medicine as quickly, and we can't. And medicine moves, you know, kind of as a second-order function, it seems like to us, and, and you can only push so hard on the process. And so, you know, you have both regulation, you have insurance, you have the doctors, you have all the perverse incentives that exist in a lot of healthcare systems that I think slow down the application of something that's truly revolutionary. Thank you. And a quick last word from you, Jen. I'm worried uh, about that, that people pay too much attention on the treatment of the prevention medicine. 
So I wish we can pay attention to the processing prevention. And the prevention was, was for the future will be the most important. Then, then again said that this is more economical. It's not the treatment. China has a big problem to treat the patients. They spend too much money and they're too late and there's too painful. So if we do it a little bit early to do the prevention and the precaution and the prediction and they will be make life much, much easy. It's not a big business, it's big life change. This is what I'm willing to say. We are doing this thing. Thank you. Well, I, I think, unfortunately, we're about out of time. Uh, one of the things I think the panel really inspired me with was, is a passion for a vision of the future that's better than today. I, I heard you say, you know, we all have a lot to learn, but I'm confident we'll be learning it together, and I'm excited about that. Please join me in thanking our great speakers today. Writer Song Li Xin, the president of the Tenants Magazine. Okay, and uh, I believe everybody uh, will remember the World Cup Russia. 
uh, in July. Uh, I'm the lawyer fine of the friends. So I asked the, the beautiful lady. He said, his answer is the only one is Russia. <laughs> I'm so happy to see uh, the friends won the championship. And uh, everybody knows the, the, the sports, this, this uh, World, uh, World Cup Russia cost uh, more than uh, 14, 40 million, 14, uh, 14 billion dollars. <laughs> it's the most uh, expensive in history. And uh, his uh, revenue is uh, more than six billion dollars. Of course, one third is uh, from, was from the China, from the Chinese <laughs> re sponsor. So uh, everybody, ever, uh, a lot of country want to have the mega events. But uh, after the second years, the economic growth will be slowed down. So today, we will discuss how to exercise the rich, in return the international sports mega events. So I'm so glad, uh, I'm so too glad to uh, introduce our uh, three, three guests. And uh, the minister of uh, uh, the, 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 three, the three guests from Japan, Russia, and China. This country, both of them, Book. yeah, both of them uh, have uh, Olympic or World Cup. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm glad to introduce Hayama, ha Hayashi. 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 <laughs> He, he's very busy because he is the minister of the education, sports, culture, and uh, science and technology. Science <laughs> and uh, technology. <laughs> A lot of things, okay. So it's uh, the beautiful lady is from Russia. He's a general director. Uh, he's uh, Tina, Tina Kandelak. Uh, Kandelak, uh, he is a uh, match TV general producer, and uh, I introduced the Xu Jicheng, Mr. Xu Jicheng, he's a, he have a, a, a many people will, will know <laughs> about, about him because, basketball. Yeah, okay, <laughs> he's a deputy director of the media and the communication department of the IQC, public of, Republic of China. Uh, okay, and uh, the first question I want to ask the minister. Oh, pardon me, I will ask the question in Chinese. Okay. Great. So my question is, after 1964, after the Tokyo Olympic Games, Japan will soon be the host of the next Olympic Games. Just like I said, we, we do have the uh, valley effect after the event because uh, uh, some of the short-term benefit will come, for example, uh, construction, communication, tourism. But after the second year of the event, the post-Olympic game event uh, effect uh, will come out. So there were a lot of concerns of holding this type of mega event because we are making double-digit dollars to uh, as the investment with, uh, comparatively speaking, little revenue. Uh, however, why the Japanese people decide to have another session of Olympic Games? So let's uh, give him a very warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Son. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really delighted yeah. to be invited to uh, this uh, summer Davos in yeah. Tenshin. And uh, fortunately, much cooler than in Tokyo here in Tenshin. It's 24 degrees centigrade, 
whereas in Tokyo still there's a 30 degrees centigrade. So thank you for the nice weather. And uh, 1964, uh, Japan's Japanese economy was still developing, like uh, not a double digit, but maybe like China now, like six, five, seven percent uh, growth. So in those days, the hard legacy we name it uh, was a very important. So for 1964, we built a super bureau train, and also we built a super express highway surrounding the Tokyo metropolitan area. So, and then that has a many, many years effect, effect and brings so many efficiency uh, for uh, our metropolitan Tokyo. So that was a big uh, legacy, but still that's a, that's a hardware. So uh, in the next 2020, we are seeing more soft legacy than hard legacy because we have so many in infrastructure already so rather than just having more road or more bureau train, uh, we are trying to have uh, what we call the uh, soft legacy, like uh, inbound. We are seeing the increase of the inbound already. Everybody would like to come to Tokyo to enjoy some sake and sushi and tempuras and the sightseeing. But that Olympic game will bring more people. And then when they come to Tokyo, they will be maybe not wa only watching the games, yeah. but enjoy all those uh, sightseeing and Japanese cuisine. So that will increase the trend, of already increasing trend of inbound to Japan. And also to aiming 2020, we are now getting ready for auto, auto automobile, <laughs> auto driving. So. Uh, maybe you will see in Tokyo Olympic game that uh, some of the taxis and automobiles will be driving without any driver. Yeah. So <laughs> wow. those are the one legacy, wow. right? Yeah. And also for that, we need another infrastructure for auto, auto driving. So those are the things that we are really aiming for as a soft legacy, less than hard legacy we had in 1964. So in total, Tokyo Metropolitan Government, which is hosting the 2020 Tokyo game, that the legacy impact will be 20, uh, 12 trillion yen, which is about uh, 108 billion US dollars. And uh, with that, uh, economic uh, ripple effects estimated by input output table will be 18 trillion yen, yeah. uh, which is about 161 billion US dollars. Yeah. So not only those, uh, 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 income by TV broadcasting or uh, sales of the goods. We are really looking uh, <coughs> forward to see all those soft legacy and not only the Olympic year, but after yeah. one, two, three decades after the Olympic game. Okay. Okay. Am okay. I speaking too, yeah. too quick? No? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, however, however, as you've just mentioned, for the previous Olympic Games, uh, you have reached the double-digit GDP increase. Uh, however, uh, I believe that uh, currently you are still having a great economic momentum. And uh, I know that after the Olympic Games, your uh, property price has been dropped. I don't know if you feel the same. Yeah, uh, we see the uh, bubble days and then bubble burst. So which is uh, maybe one, two decades after the Olympic game. Uh, so we will be uh, seeing the uh, uh, forecasting, not so much uh, downward trend of the asset because in those uh, bubble days and bubble burst days, uh, Tokyo especially yeah. uh, experienced the downward uh, of the price. So stock price was almost uh, one third or one fourth at the top of the bubble and then the, uh, at the dip. And then uh, after Aben mix for five years, we yeah. came from the uh, bottom to uh, uh, the situation now. And also that applies to the asset price like a land price. So we don't see many room for going down of the asset price even after uh, the Olympic game because uh, towards the Olympic game we already have two years only 
but there's not such a big boom of the land asset price towards the Olympic Games. So that means the land price, asset price, is not in a bubble situation for the Olympic Games. So that's why we don't see any big reason for a bubble bust after the 2020. Okay. Okay. So, uh, because. Uh, well, you've just mentioned about the five years. Um, it's a fair price to pay uh, because after the Olympic Games, uh, the Japanese people have become more and more uh, focused on their uh, practical increase of the economy. So next question would be uh, for Tina. Okay. So, Tina, the question for you. For the World Cup that just ended, what impressed you the most? And also, as I just mentioned, we talked about uh, more than $15 billion investment. That is very expensive. So, how do you comment on that? How do you comment on this most expensive thing? First of all, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I want to say that Tianjin is a beautiful town, really. And if we talk about weather, the weather is the same in Moscow now. That's unbelievable, because in Moscow now we have 24, 25 degrees. Oh. You can't believe in this, because everybody's uh, thinking that Moscow is the cold town. No, same weather here, same weather in Moscow. About atmosphere and about my impressions. Of course, as a Russian, I never be so proud of my country because atmosphere, attitude, people, smell, singing, everything is still in my heart. And I think that I would remember this experience all my life. But you mentioned a very important thing, like a journalist, numbers. Because atmosphere is very good, but the always question is, what if this atmosphere costs so much, what we can take from this atmosphere? Which kind of profit we can make with this atmosphere? And because I was knowing that this question should be appear on this stage, I prepared some interesting numbers. I think that you never heard about these numbers, but it's the first results that we have in our country. For example, I took like example, Moscow, like a capital city. Let's talk about them. For example, for many uh, ordinary Russians, uh, this was uh, something completely new. Many of them uh, never had to meet foreigners. Now, if we talk about foreigners, nearly 4.5 million people suddenly arrived only in the capital city. It's only Moscow. They were curious to go out onto the streets and uh, meet with these people. That's a good thing, because now we have this experience, how to meet a large number of tourists. Interesting thing, another one that I want to underline. Look at another things. Uh, for example, first and foremost, the infrastructure. Just to highlight a few uh, statistics. 20% of the entire land transport, tra transportation network was updated. It's an uh, amazing thing. You know, in nowadays, everybody who are appear somewhere try to find the Wi-Fi, yeah? I want to tell you something. In Moscow, if you should be in the metro, it's the 24-7 Wi-Fi. You can easily connect, and in the metro, not only the station, since you are sitting in the metro yeah, and you're using the metro, you can have a Wi-Fi. It's an unbelievable thing. I know that it's only in our capital city, and in some towns that we started to do this project. Another thing, uh, two major hospitals were renovated. Capacity uh, at airports was increased by 50%. When I was coming here, you know, I'm 20 years living in Moscow. I can stand the crowd. It was incredible. Uh, international crowd in the Moscow airport. And I was standing 30 <laughs> minutes near the exit. Not in the airport, near the exit. That's a result too. 47,000 additional jobs were created, that's important, mainly in construction and services. Two training grounds were built and six more were reconstructed. And uh, what else, interesting, about, for example, about uh, tourist numbers and about particularly Chinese, I think that you would be interesting. 
Uh, one thing, first of all, let me underline, who came to Moscow grew the number of the tourists for 56% in comparing with 2017. It's a huge number, 56%. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I told you that 4.5 million tourists visited the capital city, and which were from the beautiful, big part from the beautiful country China. About China, interesting numbers. For example, it was something of uh, 500,000 people who came from China to Russia. And uh, let's talk about shopping, about numbers too, because I was amazed when I get these numbers. Main shopping streets, Chinese people spent over, uh, please careful, spent over one, around one million dollars only on one street. <laughs> Not in the Moscow, only on one shopping street. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, the, be, uh, the next biggest spenders. The yes. Yeah. <laughs> China Avenue. <laughs> Let's talk about next biggest spenders after Chinese. Uh, they are Mexicans and Americans. Oh. Chinese are the best one. That's why <laughs> welcome to the Moscow, welcome to the Russia. <laughs> Another thing, uh, big brands like Gucci and Louis Vuitton, it was interesting because they reported that uh, their sales, they increased in two, three times. Never had been before. Another interesting thing, for example, GRP. You talk about GRP and you mentioned the GRP. What about GRP? GRP of Moscow alone increased by 2%, while tourism led to increased revenues of over 30%. Moreover, around $3 billion were earned by small and medium-sized businesses. Because all these businesses, when we start to prepare for World Cup, start to appear. That's why they earn this money. And over than $220 million in additional income for the city of Moscow. And as you know, it was 11 cities, not only Moscow. I take only one example to show you what is this result. Because everybody are scared, it's called the white elephant. I know that white elephant after World Cup and big mega sport event that a country spends a lot of money and then can't make a profit, big profit to can compare with this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, prices that it spends on these mega events. And the last thing that I want to say, uh, to answer the question, uh, how we can evaluate the return of investment from international sport mega events, our experience shows that mega the economic, events. social, cultural impacts brings huge benefits to the country. Mm. In our case, it gives a much needed boost to our economy. It's the first thing. Second thing, it helps to change people's opinions about Russia and perceptions about Russia. Because you people, tell me please, who have been in the Moscow or in the Russia since the World Cup? Raise your hands. Who have been in Moscow? Only you. I think that two persons are from Russia. Yeah. Uh, are you? Uh, six two persons, yeah. yeah six, and one, please, two, three, four, you have to come to Russia. Now we are unbelievably convenient country orientated on tourism. There is important too, because it never had been, and people saw that there is still snow in the Moscow. As I say, same weather in Tianjin and in Moscow. Now, you have to come right now, right here after Davos. <laughs> and in my opinion, in motivated and inspired young people, young people is our future. They should build new countries. Yeah. They should be yeah. fu build future for our country. And it inspires them to do a great things in the world. And sport, it's always what it's important to underline, why it's important for big nations and big <coughs> countries. It unites people, no matter which kind of religion you support, which kind of nationality you are, how many, how old are you, no matters. Because sport unites all world. And that's why we need these mega events. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tina. Okay. Thank you, Tina. I just want to add some things. The passion is still there. It's, uh, that's the sports people. Yeah. <laughs> and also that's the change or the sports can uh, influence the okay. beautiful ladies like this, <laughs> okay. like Tina. Okay. So uh, I think all the, the statistics, all, yeah. all, the, uh, all the numbers just uh, presented by Professor, by Tina, just to show that one of the key points in our topic today is uh, World Cup, or Olympic game, whatever the big events or major events, is not a burden of economic. It's a part of the economic. So there's the book written by, uh, by a German it's a author, it's called Olympic Economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the forward, in the forward, 
the, uh, the life honorable president of the IOC, International Olympic Committee, Jacques Roger. Jacques Roger. Jacques Roger. He wrote at the Olympic game or major sports events played a catalyst to the development and the redevelopment of the city. It brings not only the income of the, the, the money, but also, like Tina just mentioned, inspire young generations, young peoples. And it's just a, it's a big promotion of the city, of the country. And especially tell the world and what the country and what Moscow and what Russia have, re have achieved in the last couple of years. So uh, I covered Olympic game, Paralympic game, youth game since 1988, 40 years. Is it? So I still remember when Korea, when, when Seoul beat for the Olympic games, the GDP of the country ranked 21 in the world. Yeah. So after the game, within half years, and it reached to the 12th in the world. So 12 is uh, one of the very important mark line. That means uh, average, like, the Olympic host city in the country, the country's GDP should be averaged in the top 12 in the world. Mm -hmm. Or you got the potential to reach the top, top 10, can host a perfect, a good Olympic game. The economics goes up and down, but the legacy, just like a Professor has mentioned, is it goes forever. It goes forever. That's why it's the pink, that's why Japan, when the economics goes rapidly, you got your first game. And now you got the chance to redevelop Tokyo and reshape your economy. You got the chance to host it. You are the, the first country in Asia in, the, in East Asia to host the Olympic game and the Winter game. And Korea is the second yeah. to host the Olympic game and the Winter game. And China is the third. But, orderly speaking, the economy, is the development, is in this shape. It's, it's listed. So, uh, what we are talking about today is uh, it's a part of the, uh, the, 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 the economy. So that's why we call it uh, sports industry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good thing. So it's not yeah. a burden. Yeah. It? Okay. It's not okay. a burden. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, indeed. So I think all the three panelists are very optimistic about the overall impact of uh, major sports events on the economy. But uh, internationally, I think the opinions are divided. So my question to Mr. Xu is that we have seen some different opinions on China's very active bidding for hosting international games. So do, do we have a reasonable return? I should say... Uh, it was to host it for the third and fourth time. Why, you know? Yeah. Uh, nowadays, is the, uh, is the sad, uh, the Olympic beating or Olympic hosting uh, came into a very dark age as no city want to host it. It's a misunderstanding or it's the misled by the media. I worked as a media. And my job in the Olympic uh, Organizing Committee is the media operation. So I know the media very much. But nobody just, uh, re uh, just uh, started is a deeply, fully about the new normal or Olympic agenda 2020. Olympic agenda 2020 in Chinese is called uh, uh, and also the new normal. Yeah. The casings of the new normal is to uh, value or to add the value to flexibility, to a partnership, efficiency, and the sustainability. I don't know uh, my uh, our translators got it right in Chinese. It's called "要增加灵活性." Uh, "要增加合作性." <laughs> "要增加效率." <laughs> Uh, but what to reduce is to reduce the cost, reduce the complexity, reduce the risk, 
reduce the waste. So uh, the, according to the new normal, the IOC will just evaluate the bidding city before the final vote. Because uh, if five cities or more, six cities, 10 cities to bid the game, there's only one winner. But that means the work will produce the nine losers. So usually it will, it will tell the cities if you're not strong enough in the competition, they will vote how about the next time. This, in this way, they will save huge money for the bidding city. For each of the bidding city, for each bid for the Olympic, it cost about uh, 100 million US dollars. So that's why it's, so it's, it's an active ways to reduce the burden of the bidding, bidding city, not, not just because no, no city wants to bid the game. It's after the Ping Chang game and within one week, and the, the bidding city for the next Winter Olympic Games after Beijing has reached to seven. Because Ping Chang announced that after the closing ceremony, within five days, said the balance, the budget is balanced. That is about one point, uh, let's say it's 136 million US dollars. The budget is that, the income is all that. So, uh, <laughs> unbelievable, because Ping Chang just uh, reduced all the cost, used a lot of a temporary tent, you see, instead of the, uh, you see, the large complexity buildings. Mm. But to, to tell the truth, when I came into the Meijiang Convention Center here, you see, I've been in Tianjin many times, but this is the first time I came into the inside of the uh, conference hall like this. It's far more good enough than host the Olympic game. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Trust me. It's even bigger than the Beijing IBC, that means the International Broadcasting Center, <laughs> bigger and larger and even modern. So doesn't it mean that you host the Olympic game, the facility is only used once for Olympic game. Mm -hmm. It will use it forever after the game. So during Beijing's beat, uh, when the evaluation committee and to go to Beijing and do the venue tour over there, and when they go to the CNCC, China National Convention Center. It was the IBC, I think many of our media friends work there. And uh, they found that the schedule, the schedule is like the backdrop over here. It's all red. That means all occupied. As the customer just ordered and their exhibition to the year of 2032. Mm -hmm. So they just gave a new name to such a huge huge building, and they call it the right, uh, red elephant. You know in the Olympic history, I think Professor knows, there's a special term called white elephant. Mm -hmm. But the turnout in Beijing is the, is, the, is the red elephant. That means it's in fully used. Tell another date to, to share with our friends. It's three years after the Olympic game, and the Olympic brain, you know the Olympic green with the bird nest, the water cube, all the things over there? The yearly income is higher than China's film yearly income. Let me uh, echo with Mr. Xu that the uh, main Olympic stadium in Tokyo, built in 1964 and used, uh, have been used almost half a century. Half a century? Up until two years ago when we renewed that for the 2020. Oh. It's now being built. But I, as a child, went there and <laughs> used that many times. So it was used 50 years. Yeah. So, and also Pyeongchan things is a very phenomenal, cost-breaking Olympic game, like uh, Mr. Xu says. So that's why, uh, yeah. uh, so, sorry, that's why uh, mm. Mr. Bach okay. mm -hmm. said that Pyeongchang set up the new horizon Yes. For the Olympic Games. And horizon should be kept because uh, we had just had a three ministers meeting last week in Tokyo with China and Korea and Japan for sports minister. So, and the Pyeongchang Olympic Games, all the 
records and know-how uh, get into one book, uh, which would be like a Olympic fire. No. That like was a yeah, like a flag. <laughs> that would be being from Pyeongchang to Tokyo to Beijing. Yeah, to Beijing. So that's we decided to share. In so Beijing got a great pressure. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, this, uh, this, yeah. This, uh, in the summer, I have a big conversation, an interview with Mr. Gianni Infantino. And uh, there are another thing uh, that, like a uh, person who were in charge with media, you know, the prices on rights, they are increasing okay. every tournament yeah. to tournament. Why? Because it's interesting, yeah? Uh, if it's uh, so many things to scare, why the prices are increasing? because uh, the audience are increased unbelievably. The ceremony of opening and uh, for closing attended by one billion people for each. Every game since the World Cup was watching by the 200 million people in the world. That's why the number of sponsors are unbelievable. That's why for the market, because for the TV, for the media, for everybody of us, it's important to have some stage where we can make a presentation for the big sponsors. It's the biggest chance, and I completely agree with you. For some countries, it's always uh, the difficult thing because it's the black elephant, let's call it, because nobody knows what it should bring to country. But for the other countries who can increase all their markers, it's always possibility. It depends on country, it depends on people, and depends on people who are in charge. Yes, okay. so, so well, far, the Olympic Game and, I mean, the Summer Olympic Game, mainly because there are four Olympic Games. Mm. Summer game, winter game, mm. summer youth game, and the winter youth game. Mm. Summer game and the World Cup are the two unique, unmatched events in the world. Every penny you put it inside, and you invest it inside, it will paid off three or four times. It's as, a big as, showcase. As you know, one number that I want to mention, I think that you know about this, that Qatar, uh, who should be uh, next uh, uh, country where the World Cup uh, should be happens, uh, they uh, have a budget 200 billion dollars. <laughs> I was there, you know, I was there. It's very interesting experience. They built a town, really a town for the World Cup. They completely changed all infrastructure starting for the water infrastructure, because it's interesting, they can move by the water, uh, finishing with the metro. They did the things that they never had did before, and I asked them, it's unbelievable budget, can't compare with anybody in the world. Okay. And they told me, you know what? Because they start to compete for a tourist. And you are quite right uh, that if it starts for the long-term things, of course, you can attend for the result like a kid, and then, and you Middle Ages, you should be still using this infrastructure. And amortization of this infrastructure, that's a very important financial thing yes. that can be counted. In Qatar, they're doing it very wisely, and that should be next very interesting okay. experience. Okay. Well, I think they are very united uh, as for convincing me, uh, like I'm questioning all of them. Well, I think uh, still I'm the, uh, I can recall that uh, we are uh, applying for the Olympic Games. Uh, Back then, we have the slogan of the one world, one dream, and China then become more international. But still, I believe there are a lot of uh, people are having questions. So now I would like to open the floor to receive questions. Uh, if you would like to ask some more questions, uh, taking my set for more questionings, because we know uh, Tina has been always very exciting. She is still in the hot atmosphere as in July. Uh, but as for the uh, minister of uh, uh, Yushimasa, uh, you will be in another Olympic Games, uh, so you will be very exciting. And also for Mr. Xu, you have been there uh, for Olympic Games, for two sessions of Olympic Games. Therefore, you are very optimistic and very enthusiastic uh, about uh, having uh, the long-term benefit of having, uh, of organizing the mega event. Uh, even if we don't have the balance of investment and the revenue for the short time, this will still be a thing worthwhile investing. So let's open the floor. Uh, thank you. Um, it's re very interesting to get this panel uh, on on basically innovation-focused uh, um, 
event. Um, so I have a, a question um, uh, to Tina. Um, so uh, my name is Yaroslav. I, I come from Ukraine. Um, and um, in our country, we were really concerned about what was happening recently, both politically, but also in the field of sport. So you mentioned like some things like how Russia is great, how many like income it generated for the business, um, and how many people opened uh, your country. Uh, but my, my question is, how ethical is that to your point like having the country involved in war conflict uh, and hosting that major event. Like, do you think, is it like ethical stuff? And do you think like promoting um, politics under sport is fine? Thanks. Thank you, Yaroslav, for, for, for your question. <laughs> That's a very good question because I heard this question for many Ukrainian journalists a lot of time. And you know what is the big plus of the World Cup? And I think that you have to learn it. Why uh, Olympic Games are appear? You know, historically. As you know, and all Ukrainian viewers know me, I was the host of the Brainiest. And it was a very good question that I always gave to kids. How Olympic Games are based? You know why they based that all wars, all conversation about wars, all conversation about political degrees are stopped in this moment because all big sport events can only unite people. That's why I was always amazed when since this fantastic uh, tournament, these questions are appeared because it's the time when people should unite in many different ways. And I think that you have to do it too. That's why I never think about the political disagreement since the World Cup. I only think about political opportunities that the World Cup gives Russia and all world. Thank you. Okay. So, if may I uh, say something about this? And uh, sports is always in the shadow of, the, of politics because the big events, major events, is uh, such a huge and the powerful platform. So some of the times and the people like to talk about the politics with sports, but what we should do is a separate sports and separate the sports with the politics. It's two different things. Because just like the slogans in Beijing games, one word, one dream, you see. But historically, each of the Olympic games got some politic issues in it. But that never stopped the steps of the uh, major events like Olympic Game or World Cup, just like Katina has just mentioned, because the same, because the dream is a piece, just like in uh, youth, uh, just like in the Pyeongchang Games, you remember, North Korea and South Korea, they matched into the stadium with the same flag, you see, with the Peninsula's flag. And now, Olympic game, one of the big fruit for the Pyeongchang games is uh, not how much money they earn, not how much money knows that Pyeongchang is uh, one of the, uh, the tourists for the snow sports. Uh, it's about the two sides of Korea. Till this morning, you see, the two presidents yeah. meet together. Why, we look it at, uh, why don't we look it at uh, activity? as a positive ways. And just the sports is the same, but we can use it for different purpose. Thank That's you. my suggestion. Is it? it was a very okay. good example because I'm so sorry, I can a little bit continue. It was a big fight. If the guys who like boxing know their names, biggest fighter, Kavalev and Dusik. Usik was Ukrainian citizen. I was attend to this uh, boxing show. And Dusik yeah. win in the center of the oh, Russia, in the capital of Moscow. He win, and Ukraine and Athen was played in the place where this tournament happened. All Russian citizens stand up and support this winner. Because what is important in sport and what possibilities sport give us? It's always a little bit up of politics. It's always give us chance. Don't take it, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bruce Leslie. I'm representing the city of Calgary. Uh, past host of an Olympic Games and also oh, potentially a future host of, a, of the 2026 Games. 
Um, Tina, I have to ask a question of, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, first of all, I should mention that our bid, as it is, should it come through, is going to be quite a bit more modest than anything that we're talking about here. And I think it's part of that uh, Olympic 2020 that you mentioned. Um, but you, Tina, you mentioned that Qatar's budget, did I, did I hear you say that it was 200 billion? For Qatar? For Qatar. Yeah, sure. Now, and you also said in the same sentence that that was a wise investment. In Qatar? Yeah. In my opinion, you have been in Qatar? No. Uh, <laughs> that's I, I, just, I, I guess my question is, when no, no, no. does it become unsustainable? Um, when you're spending that kind of money and the opportunity costs, we're looking at a maybe $6 billion Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. um, is, doesn't there have to be a change in the direction of the spending? Uh, uh, that's, you know, because I'm a journalist, first of all, it's always a little trick when you ask the person, you know, have you been there? But that's an important uh, key, because if you have been there, you have much more opinion based on facts not on emotions. I have seen with my own eyes the completely different country. It's unbelievable project, starting with Zaha Hadid, uh, God raised her soul uh, in the past, with unbelievable construction of the stadium, finishing with this uh, metro project. And they have a very good formula for how to return their money. If you will want to comment this Qatar factor, we have to be deeply in the content based on facts. They, I think that Davos should have uh, brilliant possibilities to have here Hassan Al-Tawadi, the head of the committee of uh, uh, World Cup. He can tell you about which kind of formula they prepare. They are not the people who are spend their money easily. They invest in their own country, but with a long-term return. And they know what they do, believe me. You have to go to Qatar. Sir, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sir, uh, May I uh, tell some of the, uh, my own experiences? That, yes, for a journalist, for the first 10 or 20 years, I just always think the Olympic cost is so big, the budget. The budget is always the top topic. It's the before the game, during the game, and after the game. But till the 2005, I joined the organizing committee. I, I go to the other side of the river. And from the journalist, from a, from a guy to ask questions. Shall I go on there? And from the other side, the, the cost for Olympic game is very easy to figure out. One day, 100 million US dollars. One day, 100 US million dollars. That is the operation phase for that. Hmm. It's a 70 days. It's a very easy to figure out. That is the budget. Olympic Games cost. All the others is the relative or non-relative. All the others is the city spent to build the city or redevelop the city. Will Olympic use it for Beijing the airport, T3, Terminal 3, the highway, and all the, all the new buildings and venues. And after the Olympic Games, the, the city will still continue to use that. That's, that part is called sustainability. So it's very clear the two parts of the budget. Okay. Uh. How? All right, we've just got the reminder of the last three minutes for this session. So maybe we can invite this lady to ask a question. And hopefully the last question will be a very short question. We're talking about the financial benefit or return on investment, but we haven't really discussed the social impact. Because Olympic Games or similar Games World Cup promote grassroots uh, sports. I just wanted to ask the, uh, the three of you that have you seen the real benefit on the social impact and how the Olympics and other big games has helped children with their future, especially with their sports future? Thank you. So last question, maybe I can pop it to the minister. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good point. I think uh, we uh, already set up the sports plan in preparation for Olympic Games so that uh, the ratio of the adult in Japan playing sports once a week is still 42.5%. So it's less than 50%. So 
towards the Olympic Games, we are trying to increase this to 65%. And that will help make themselves very healthy, not only the top street, but everybody, including ladies and gentlemen, and young and old, and especially for those old people participating in the sports. It's nice because the, uh, we have a long longevity, the Japanese. Uh, women lives up to 90 years old, and men lives up to 80 to 3. But that is the uh, longevity as a, uh, uh, as a life. But uh, you are not healthy last uh, seven years or five years. So we are trying to extend the healthy longevity of Japanese. And to that end, uh, being included in the sports activity is really crucial. So that's one. And another point is the uh, Paralympic effect. Because the uh, 1964 is the first Olympic game goes with, went with Paralympic. So that Tokyo is hosting the second Olympic and Paralympic together in 2020. So towards that, we are already starting the inclusive society. So that uh, already I see in these one to three years that the TV commercial is using not only Olympic athletes, but also Paralympic athletes. That sells. So the society mindset is changing to accept, and not only accept, treating equal with the Paralympic and Olympic athletes and the concept together. So this is a big social impact, I think. Well, thank you. I am sure there are a lot of uh, questions unanswered and also many exciting insights from the panel. But I apologize for uh, not having enough time to address all of the questions. So we have been doing a lot of math on the stage, uh, how much it costs and uh, how much return it can generate. But I think not everything can be calculated in economic terms. Uh, all the major events we have followed in the past decades are just like the girls and boys we chased back in school. They will leave a very deep impression and imprint on our future life and also generate continuous social impact. So thank you all for your attention. Just, just a quick announcement. If you'd like to continue the conversation about the growth of the sports and esports industries in China, I'm hosting an industry session on Thursday morning in Fribourg at 9.30. Uh, please come